Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. If you've been watching my videos, you know that these videos are intended for use who are enrolled in my course, Microbiology 2420, or Microbiology for the Health Sciences at Del Mar College. If anyone else out there in YouTube land finds them helpful, by all means, use them. Uh, hit like and subscribe or leave me some feedback so I know if I can, uh, if I need to keep doing these videos. Anyway, <clears throat> so, Today's video is over the differences between what we call prokaryotes or prokaryotic cells and eukaryotes or eukaryotic cells. Now, this is a term that a lot of people haven't heard until you take a microbiology or a biology class. And there are huge differences between the two cells. In the world of microbiology, we're going to spend a tremendous amount of time on the prokaryotes, particularly one class of prokaryotes called bacteria. So, earlier... Um, in one of the earlier videos, we talked about the classification scheme for all living organisms, and all organisms fall into one of three domains. Those domains include archaea, which used to be called archaea bacteria, but it's been changed to archaea because they are different than bacteria. And then another class called bacteria, eubacteria, um, is a term they used to use, but we call them bacteria now. And then we have protista, animalia, plantae, and fungi. Some of those cells are prokaryotes and some of those are eukaryotes. So if we were going to start listing this stuff, for the prokaryotes, this includes the two domains, archaea and bacteria. All archaea and all bacteria are prokaryotes. Under eukaryotes, this includes protista. Remember, protista are single-celled organisms. They're single-celled animal cells. And then there is fungi, there's plantae, and there's animalia. And let me make sure that I'm not writing off the edge of my screen here. I should be butting right up against it. Good. I'm there. I'm going to tilt my camera just a little bit so it's a little bit more in line. Okay? So, so these are our kingdoms of living organisms. The domains would be archaea, bacteria, and then we would have, um, man, I'm drawing a blank, uh, eukarya. And for the eukarya, we have four different kingdoms, protista, fungi, plantae, and animals. So all protists, all fungi, all plants, and all animals are eukaryotic cells. All bacteria and all archaea are prokaryotic cells. So. What does the term prokaryote and the term eukaryote mean? Well, if we break the words down, pro can mean before, and karyo comes from the term karyon, which means nucleus. So, when scientists first started looking at cells under microscopes and, and observing them, they noticed that some cells had a little seed or kernel inside of it. They didn't know it was a nucleus, they didn't know what it did, so it was originally called the carrion, which in Latin means kernel. We now know that that's the nucleus. Other cells did not seem to have a carrion inside of them. So they classified these cells as being prokaryotes before they had a nucleus. And it's believed, and to this day, that these cells evolved first, and then eukaryotes evolved after prokaryotes. So they called them prokaryotes, meaning before they had a nucleus. For the term eukaryotes, eu means true. And of course, karyo refers to the nucleus. These cells have a true nucleus, meaning they have their DNA is enclosed in a, in a membrane uh, a phospholipid bilayer or a lipid bilayer that's a membrane. Actually, it's called a nuclear envelope. So, now, so if I go look at prokaryotes and eukaryotes, one of the major differences between these, first of all, another uh, difference that we can say about prokaryotes is that they are unicellular. Right? Means that they are one celled organisms where eukaryotes can be unicellular or they can be multicellular, meaning many cells. Protista are unicellular. 
But plantae and animalia for certain are multicellular and fungi are usually uh, multicellular um, when we talk about things like mushrooms and stuff. Now, another distinguishing characteristic between both of these is really this, okay? These guys lack a membrane bound nucleus and organelles. Prokaryotic cells do not have a membrane around their nucleus or they don't have, they, in addition, they don't have any membrane bound organelles. These guys do have a membrane bound nucleus Oops, I can't write right now. These guys do have a membrane bound nucleus plus membranous organelles. And we're gonna we're going to review some of this in just a few minutes. Okay. So one of the major distinguishing characteristics between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is that prokaryotes do not have a nucleus around their DNA. They just, and they do not have any membrane-bound organelles. They don't lack organelles. They do have a single, uh, or they have one of the organelles they, they share in common with eukaryotes is ribosomes. But they don't have the same ribosomes as we do. And as you know, ribosomes, or you should know, ribosomes don't have a membrane around them. When I'm talking about membranous organelles, I'm talking about things like the Golgi apparatus, the um, endoplasmic reticulum, both smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, and mitochondria, or as in plants, we can have, um, and, and um, uh, well, in plants, we can have uh, chloroplasts for photosynthesis, as well as in some fungi. So, that is one of the big, giant differences. You should put a big star around this, and you should know all eukaryotes have a membrane-bound nucleus and membranous organelles. All prokaryotes lack the membrane-bound nucleus and the membranous organelles. They don't have them. One of the things that, these, uh, that we do know is that the ribosomes in prokaryotes are said to be 70S ri ri uh, ribosomes. The S stands for a unit called a Spedberg unit, and it's a unit that we use to measure the sedimentation rate of um, these ribosomes and pro, I'm sorry, eukaryotes have what we call 80s ribosomes. They have a higher Spedberg unit rating, and they they um, they sediment out faster. And this is kind of a big deal, but not as much for us as the membrane-bound organelle thing. Now, um, one of the other distinguishing characteristics: the cell wall. In prokaryotes, it's rather complex. It's a very complex cell wall. And um, almost all bacteria have them. There's a few that don't, but they're found in almost all bacteria. And another thing we know is that it is made of what we call proteo glycans. Now we talked a little bit about proteoglycans in our sugar, I mean in our sugar, in our chemistry section. Glycans are sugars, proteos are proteins. And so we have these short peptides and sometimes, um, well, amino acids linking the sugars together. And so they're called proteoglycans, okay? Now the cell wall in eukaryotes is only in Plants, and in plants, it's not made out of proteoglycans. Well, basically, we should say this first. It is rather simple in structure. The structure of the cell wall in plants, in, in, in the eukaryotes that do have them, is rather simple. In prokaryotes, it's extremely complex and found in almost all of the bacteria. In eukaryotes, it's only in plants and it's made out of a stuff called cellulose, which is a whole bunch of sugar stuck together in a specific arrangement. And it's found in fungi. And in fungi, it's made out of a stuff called chitin. Chitin is a bunch of sugars that are linked together with some nitrogen that gives it a different structure. 
So the cell wall structure of the eukaryotes that do have them, plants and fungi, is very simple, very different than the proteoglycan structure of the cell wall of bacteria. And we're going to make a big deal about this because we're going to talk about it in great detail either later on in this video or possibly in the next video depending on how long this one drags out. Now, um, a couple of other details. We know that in bacteria, they divide, remember this is the division sign if you were looking at a calculator, they divide by a process called binary fission. Essentially, they copy their chromosome and they split in half. And there's not a lot of steps involved like in mitosis, okay? In eukaryotes, they divide by mitosis or yeast can do a process that we also call budding. They literally can pinch a section of themselves off and regrow it. So prokaryotes divide by binary fission. Eukaryotes essentially divide by mitosis. The cells do. We do have meiosis when for sex cells and but by budding, okay? Um, and finally, we can talk about the size. The size in, for the um, prokaryotes is extremely small. So we're about one, 0 0.1 to about five microns thick. And if you've um, paid attention to uh, what we do in laboratory, we talk about the measurements from meters to millimeters, which is a thousandth of a meter, to micrometers or microns. A micrometer or micrometer, the micrometer is one millionth of a meter. So these are little tiny cells. And the size for um, eukaryotes is rather large compared to the prokaryotes. And they can be anywhere from 10 to 100 microns in size. And this funky looking M is a mu which is part of the abbreviation for microns. So these are some basic essential differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And I think all students that, that are taking microbiology should be able to list these differences. Prokaryotes consist of both archaea and bacteria. They are unicellular or single-celled organisms. They lack membrane-bound organelles and a membranous nucleus. They have 70S ribosomes. Their cell wall is rather complex. Almost all bacteria have one. It's made of a structure called proteoglycans. And they divide by binary fission and are very small. There's also one other major difference, and we're going to talk about it in a second. I was just running out of room, and I'll add it up here. For eukaryotes, it consists of protista, or single-celled animals, fungi, plants, and animals. They are, can be unicellular, like protists, or multicellular, like the others. They have membrane-bound organelles and a membranous nucleus. They have ADS ribosomes. The cell wall, if they have it, is simple. It's only found in plants, and it consists of a compound called cellulose and fungi. The cell wall is made up of a structure called protein, I mean protein, chitin. Prokaryotes, I'm sorry, eukaryotes divide by mitosis, and some yeast, a type of fungus, will divide by budding, and they're very large in size. One other major difference, so I'm, I'm, please allow me to erase all this, and I'm going to add one other major difference that we should put on the list. I simply run out of room on this board. I can't get a longer board or get taller, and as I write closer to the bottom of the board, you guys know that my writing gets more messy because it's harder to hold the pen at the correct angle. Okay? That blue marker is hard to erase, but it's, I think it stands out well. For prokaryotes, the chromosomes, there is one single chromosome and it is circular. For eukaryotes, the chromosomes are, they have many chromosomes. And they are linear in shape. So Bacteria and archaea can have a circular chromosome. And in reality, it kind of gets all twisted and mangled in there. And sometimes it can look like a big mess. But if you pulled the ends, it would look like a, a single circular chromosome. 
where in eukaryotes the chromosomes are very long and linear and multiple in number. For example, human cells have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. The chromosomes in prokaryotes are not paired up. It is a double-stranded DNA molecule, but that's it, and it's in a single circle. One last detail. The extra genetic material is in the form of what we call a plasmid. Prokaryotes can have plasmids. It's extra chromosomal DNA or DNA outside the chromosome. They can have these small rings, sometimes more than one, of things called a plasmid. And essentially these can be genes that can be taken out of the main chromosome and added back in if they need to you know, make these particular proteins. Also, plasmids can be transferred from one bacterium to another um, through a process called conjugation. And we're going to talk about that when the time is right. Where there is no plasmids found in eukaryotes. The only other DNA that we talk about inside eukaryotic cells is called mitochondrial DNA. And oddly enough, mitochondria can resemble bacteria or prokaryotes in some instances because they have um, different ribosomes and they also have a single circular chromosome. It's been hypothesized that bacteria were actually phagocytosed by ancient cells um, and those special bacteria had the ability to convert um, the leftovers from what we call glycolysis, converting sugar into energy. They could take those leftovers and turn it into even more ATP and that was beneficial for the cells that engulfed them so they didn't digest them with lysosomes and kept them around. And so um, anyway, we're not going to talk about that in great detail. But um, mitochondria can have some DNA outside the nucleus of eukaryotes, and mitochondria are a membranous organelle. Now, I'm going to do a very fast run-through of some of the organelles, membrane-bound organelles and other organelles, in eukaryotes. Okay? This is going to be a quick run-through because you should have covered this in AMP1 um, and reiterated in AMP2, which most students have before they take micro or you had it in freshman biology. Now, um, if we were to look at a eukaryotic cell, first of all, the outer membrane, if I were to look at the outer membrane, it's actually two layers of lipids, okay? We call the outer membrane a lipid bilayer, and we're gonna look at it in a little bit more detail a little bit later. But essentially, it is layers of these structures called lipids, which have a hydrophobic head, a little ring of carbons and hydrogens, a uh, hydrophilic head. The head loves to interact with water, and the tails are said to be hydrophobic. They don't like to interact with water. And they're in two layers like this, and then between some of them, there are other structures like proteins that can be loosely attached to the inside of the cell membrane. We call these peripheral proteins. And they would be loosely attached to the inside of the cell membrane everywhere like this. We also have some proteins that can span all the way across and are embedded. And these are called integral membrane proteins. Or sometimes just called integral proteins now. And those proteins would go all the way across the cell membrane and function in different ways, okay? And so we see all these lipids lined up with these proteins associated with them. And they form this lipid bilayer for the cell membrane. Now most of the organelles membranes are very similar in structure. Oh, and there's one other thing that we find in um, uh, eukaryotic membranes that we don't find in prokaryotic membranes, and that is cholesterol. Or it belongs to a class of compounds called sterols, which are similar to steroids, but alcohol in form. 
And so we see these sterols inside of the lipid bilayer of eukaryotic cells. Now, inside of here, I'm gonna have a bunch of chromosomes that are all kind of in here as a bunch of individual pieces. And around those chromosomes, I'm gonna have another lipid layer called the nuclear membrane. And if I were to look at it in three dimensions, the nuclear membrane has openings in it. And so those things are called nuclear pores. And so a eukaryotic cell has a, a nice membrane bound nucleus that contains all of the DNA. And that nuclear membrane actually has two lipid bilayers that have holes that allow things to enter or exit the nucleus called nuclear pores. One of the membranous organelles that's also associated with the um, with the eukaryotes are these long tubular pieces of membrane that can all be interconnected and interspersed throughout the cell. And we often refer to this as the ER, which stands for endoplasmic reticulum. And there's two types of endoplasmic reticulum. If the endoplasmic reticulum has little ribosomes attached to the surface, then we call this the rough endoplasmic reticulum because the surface of it looks very rough or bumpy under an electron micrograph when you look at it under an electron microscope. If it lacks the ribosomes, we call it the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now this membrane is made up essentially of the same lipids as the nuclear membrane. And what happens is every now and then, this piece of membrane can be invaginated and pinched off. And that little bubble that pinches off contains pretty much lipids. And there can be some sugars in there, but what happens is these lipids will go and fuse with the cell membrane and join it, and this is how the cell can grow and add membrane. It can also take some membrane in through a process called endocytosis. But, so the smooth endoplasmic reticulum essentially has a lot of lipids for membrane growth and repair. Now one of the things we know about eukaryotes is that they can have ribosomes that are floating freely in the cytoplasm and not attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. As a matter of fact, most books make you think that the ribosomes are either attached or fixed or bound or free floating. And that's not really what happens. These ribosomes can pop off the endoplasmic reticulum and one of these could pop on and there's a way that that happens. It can attach and, and uh, unattach to the endoplasmic reticulum. One of the things we know that all ribosomes do is that ribosomes read a messenger RNA, a message, and they build a protein. The messenger RNA tells them what order to put the amino acids in in order to build a protein. So one of the things we say about ribosomes is that ribosomes' main function is protein synthesis. Of course, proteins are the functional molecules in our cells. They are the enzymes performing a lot of biochemical reactions. They are providing the cytoskeleton for shape and structure. And they do a number of other things and form integral membrane proteins and peripheral proteins that can act as enzymes or the integral membrane proteins can allow substances to enter or exit the cell. We've talked about um, ion channels in previous classes and things. So ribosomes build or synthesize the proteins. They assemble them one amino acid at a time and the number and the order of the amino acids makes one protein different from the other and they get that information from the DNA in the nucleus. Now, so if ribosomes are gonna build a protein that stays inside the cell, then the ribosomes are free-floating ribosomes. And when they're done reading the message, they leave it alone and they release the protein to do its function. If the ribosome gets a message that tells it build this protein and this protein is going to be moved around to another membrane inside the cell, the cellular membrane, or be secreted by a vesicle, then that ribosome will attach to the endoplasmic reticulum and it will build the protein inside the endoplasmic reticulum. And so the endoplasmic reticulum can be filled with proteins if it's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then what can happen here is if I pinch a bubble of membrane off of the rough ER, 
that bundle of membrane is going to have a bunch of these proteins in it. And so sometimes we can pinch a bubble of membrane called a, a transport vesicle off of the endoplasmic reticulum and it will transport proteins around the cell. Another membranous organelle that we need to mention is one called the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi body or the Golgi complex. People use different names, but they're all the same thing. Golgi apparatus, Golgi complex, Golgi body. And it's usually a series of flattened membranous discs like this. It's made out of the same membrane as the ER and the um, cell membrane and the nuclear envelope essentially. And what happens often is if a protein is going to be sorted out of the cell, in many instances, this transport vesicle will fuse with the Golgi apparatus and then it will deposit the proteins into the Golgi apparatus. And in my simplified explanation of this, the Golgi apparatus kind of wor works like the quality control. It checks the proteins and makes sure that they are perfect. If there's any modification that needs to happen to them, then they're modified. And eventually, through a series of vesicles, we can pass those proteins from one to the other. And then finally, the Golgi apparatus will pinch off a bubble of membrane filled with proteins that can then go fuse with the cell membrane and secrete those proteins outside the cell. We call that a secretory vesicle. So these are some of the major membranous organelles. We have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that pinches off bubbles of membrane for membrane coat and repair. The rough endoplasmic reticulum, which has ribosomes bound to it, that is gonna fill with proteins, pinch off transport vesicles, and transport proteins inside those vesicles all over the cell. The Golgi apparatus can receive those transport vesicles that carry proteins for secretion, check and modify the proteins, package them into a secretory vesicle and they will be secreted. And then free ribosomes are just going to build proteins and release them inside the cell. One major, major player inside of our cells, and very often books make these guys orange, I don't know why, um, are these membranous organelles called mitochondria. And mitochondria can found, be found throughout the cell, and mitochondria help take the leftovers from converting um, glucose into two sugars and the trash that's left over goes into mitochondria and gets turned into 32 to 34 more sugar molecules, I'm sorry, ATP molecules. So we can convert sugar into ATP, but some of the trash that's left over gets run through mitochondria and they produce an overwhelming majority of the energy for the cell in the form of a molecule called adenosine triphosphate phosphate, or ATP. So these are a lot of membranous organelles. There's a few other organelles we're not going to talk a lot about, like there's some protein structures called centrioles that aid in separating chromosomes, and we can talk about some other things. But this is the basic appearance of a eukaryotic cell, a membrane-bound nucleus with all the linear chromosomes. That nucleus has nuclear pores, so things can enter or exit. The DNA in here codes for all the proteins that the cell can make, but the ribosomes can't get in and they can't read DNA so we rewrite or transcribe the DNA into a message called messenger RNA and send it out to the ribosomes. <coughs> Excuse me. If the protein remains inside the cell, then the ribosome will stay free. It'll read the message, build the protein, release the protein, release the message. If the protein needs to be transported around the cell or sorted, then the ribosome will attach to the rough endoplasmic reticulum build the protein inside the ER, and then the ER will pinch off a transport vesicle to transport the proteins around. Very often if the protein is gonna be secreted, not always, but usually, it goes through the Golgi apparatus, which can check the protein, modify it if it needs to be, and then um, package it in a secretory vesicle for secretion, and mitochondria are for, for turning a lot of the sugars into ATP or energy for the cell. Now, I didn't cover every organelle. Inside the nucleus is the nucleolus, which is a region in the nucleus where ribosomes are assembled, or at least parts of the ribosome are made, and then they're shipped out and assembled in the cytoplasm. And there's a lot of other things. And there's a whole list of these in my notes. We can talk about the cytosol. We can talk about vesicles and vacuoles. You know, one other thing, well, I guess two other organelles I should mention. Um, 
Eukaryotic cells have a little bubble of membrane that contains specialized enzymes called lysosomes, which break down any foreign substances. All of these are a review, so you should review the list that's in my notes or in your textbooks that you need to go over. Now, if we were talking about plants or photosynthetic fungi, then they would also have a, a membrane-bound organelle inside them called a chloroplast. Chloroplasts contain enzymes that use energy from sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into sugar, and then they can turn the sugar into energy. So um, we happen to call cells that can make their own energy, and by the way, the chloroplasts are very often drawn as these little green things, and they have little structures inside of them. We're not going to talk about them. But a chloroplast um, is a membranous organelle, and basically it can take carbon dioxide and water and convert it into sugar using sunlight from energy. Hence the term synthesis to make sugar from these things, and photo using photons of light as energy to do it. And then the sugars can be converted into ATP. And so we call cells that do photosynthesis autotropes meaning self-feeding. They can feed themselves or make their own um, sugar. Cells that cannot make their own sugar have to get the sugar from somewhere else or their food source somewhere else, so we call those heterotrophs. Autotrophs make their own food. Heterotrophs have to get it from somewhere else. So the autotrophic eukaryotes also have chloroplasts in them, which allow us to convert energy I mean, the energy of sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into sugar, and then it can be turned into ATP. So those are the major players. Now, if I were to look at a prokaryote, all of this changes. So I hope you have a good idea of what all of this is. I'm going to erase some of this stuff, and we're going to draw a prokaryote. Now, prokaryotes can come in different shapes and sizes. I'm going to draw one right now that we call a rod shape. And I want to talk a little bit in detail about um, some of the uh, characteristics of these prokaryotes. We know that prokaryotes are unicellular. We know that uh, they're very small in size. We learned some of their characteristics. They have a single chromosome. So I'm going to draw one. Now, Granted, eukaryotes are much larger than prokaryotes. So really, if I were going to draw what we call a rod-shaped prokaryote, prokaryotes can come in different shapes, and I'm not going to get into that yet. But one of the shapes we say is a rod, or it would be like a cigar shape, a very narrow um, shape like this. Okay, A prokaryote, and they can sometimes have flagella on them, sometimes multiple flagella, and sometimes they have these other things sticking off of them called fimbri or pili, depending on which one we're looking at. It would be very tiny compared to a eukaryote, but then my drawing would be hard for you to see. So I'm gonna take this little prokaryote and I'm going to enlarge this prokaryote here, and we're gonna draw basically what one would look like, and we're really gonna focus in on the cell membrane and the cell wall, and if it has it, a glycocalyx or capsule, okay? And these are important structures on prokaryotes. So, if I were to use blue as the same color for this membrane, then this little prokaryote is going to have a cell membrane. And it's going to be a lipid bilayer, just like in a eukaryote. And it's very similar in structure, um, with some minor differences, which we're not going to get totally into just yet. Now, I'm going to cut or scoop out and leave some of the membrane intact, so that it's as if we're cutting into this little cigar or oval shaped structure. But then inside of that, um, or actually outside of that, we have what's called a cell wall. And I hope you can see that and read that marker. And this would be the cell membrane. Also sometimes called the plasma membrane. And it's the same in both of these. 
The cell membrane is the innermost layer, but outside the cell membrane can be a cell wall. Now plants and some fungi can have a cell wall, but almost all prokaryotes or bacteria in particular are going to have this cell wall. Now, when we're starting to look at this structure, it's rather complex, and I'm not gonna get into the exact drawing of it, but outside of the cell wall would be another layer called the glycocalyx. So calyx can refer to sort of a complex structure, and glyco meaning sugars. And the glycocalyx can vary from one bacterium to the other. Some bacteria, they call it a capsule, and in others, it can be referred to as a um, slime layer, depending on how thick it is, okay? Now, we can also have some flagella coming off of here. Oops, I didn't spell that very well. Now, one thing we know about flagella, and some can have a single flagellum, and some can have multiple flagella, and sometimes they can be at opposite poles, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the flagella is essentially a protein structure. It's a long series of proteins that provides motility. It allows the bacterium to wiggle those proteins around, kind of like actin and myosin in muscle cells, and as it wiggles them, it can propel it through fluids and help them swim. Also, out here, are can be some small appendages, hair-like structures sticking off. That we can call fimbri or pili. There's a slight difference between fimbri and pili, but essentially, they function in attachment. And for the bacteria that have this, not all bacteria have a glycocalyx. And not all bacteria have flagella. Not all bacteria have fimbri and pili. But the ones that do, the fimbri and pili provide a, an ability for them to attach to other cells. And sometimes that helps them in being pathogen and the, pathogenic and that they can attach the cells and create some disease. Now, there's different types of pili. Some of the pili function in attachment. Some bacteria have what we call a sex pili. So sometimes I have, can, I have a bac two bacteria and one bacteria with its pilus. I think I put two else, but anyway. Um, they can attach, the ba two bacteria can be attached by a pili. And if there's a small plasmid in here of DNA, that plasmid can be transferred to another bacterium. It's the closest that bacteria get to having sex. It's actually called sexual conjugation um, or conjugation between bacteria. And so they call it the sex pili. And sex pili will allow one bacterium to attach to another and transfer a piece of DNA called a plasmid and then uh, transfer some new genetic information. For example, some bacteria have plasmids that break, that have enzymes that can break down antibiotics, and they can transfer that to another one and now make that one antibiotic resistant, and we can talk about that, all right? So, let me make sure I'm not jumping too far ahead, okay? I wanna make sure I go over these things in a way that um, I'm following, somewhat following what's in my notes, although it may not be in the exact same order, okay? Um, now, one of the things that we do know about the capsule or the glycocalyx is it's a rather slimy layer. It's, it's very mucousy or slimy. It's a lot of sugars, and it can provide the virulence, what, what makes some people sick with certain bacteria, okay? Um, it actually can, can form a number or, or play a number of roles. Um, sometimes the capsule can protect the bacterium from drying out and, and help it maintain some of the fluids it can provide its virulence or pathogenicity. Um, it can provide protection from things like phagocytosis. So if a white blood cell were gonna come over here and swallow this up, 
they can't get through the capsule sometimes. So it protects them against phagocytosis. Um, and, uh, and again, I said it, it can help them attach to other cells, okay? Now, um, one of the things that we do know about the cell membrane of prokaryotes that, that um, I talked about when we were drawing out the eukaryote is there are no sterols like cholesterol. Um, prokaryotic cell membranes lack sterols, no cholesterol or other sterols where eukaryotic cells have that. Okay, and no eukaryotic cell has a capsule that we know of. Okay, um, now um, one of the things that I do want to point out, by the way, fimbri are rather uh, much longer than pili. Pili are usually rather short. Uh, they, I did say they both play a role in attachment, but pili can also be involved in, in conjugation. So that's an important note for you guys to make. Um, and when we look inside the bacterium, one of the things that I want to point out to you is that the DNA inside the bacterium is usually a single circular chromosome. And, but it doesn't always appear as a single ring. I'm going to draw it like one for now. But that's the chromosome. This is the DNA. And in some bacteria, because it gets all folded up and starts to look like this, then they call the region where the chromosome is the nucleoid. It's not a true nucleus, but it's somewhat nucleoid in nature, and that's where the DNA are. But there's no membrane around it. And then also out here in the cytoplasm, we'll have all the little ribosomes that are going to do protein synthesis. And they can have a plasmid, some extra chromosomal DNA. And that's really about it. They're much simpler. There's some cytosol, some fluid in here that has sugars and proteins and ions in it, just like any other cytosol or cytoplasm of a cell. But what's lacking inside the cytoplasm of a bacterium is all of the membranous organelles. They are essentially a cell membrane, a cell wall, a glycocalyx, if it has it, with a nucleoid region that has a single circular chromosome, some ribosomes, and maybe a plasmid, some extra chromosomal DNA. And then some of them have flagella, some have fimbriae, and some have pili. Okay. Now, um, when we start to talk about these layers, it's really important for us to take a really close look at the cell membrane and the cell wall and the glycocalyx of bacteria. Now, I will say this, there's one other um, structure that can be associated with some bacteria. And there's a thing called an axial filament. And these are protein-like structures that can wrap around or spiral around the bacterium. And we find them in a lot of spiral bacteria like Spirilla and a few others. And um, they help give shape and form. And some of those bacteria will sort of corkscrew their way through things. And those ridges that are created, the bulge that's created on the outside edge by these spiral proteins will allow them to corkscrew and, and, and their way through things for motility. And so we call those axial filaments. Um, now, I'm going to go and I want to draw out in great detail the difference between these cells, okay? Um, or the, between the membranes of different types of bacteria. So I'm going to erase my eukaryotic cell. You can see a good example of the differences between the two. And do remember, all of this would be compacted into this little tiny guy compared to a large eukaryotic cell. All right. Now, as I erase my eukaryotic cell, that's going to allow me to go and focus and give me some space so that we can draw and focus on what, what does the covering of a bacterium really look like. So imagine if I went and I cut a large section of this covering out of the bacterium and I drew it in detail. And we're going to go from outside the bacterium to inside. 
Well, when we classify bacteria, most bacteria, not all, but most can be classified in multiple ways. And the two, po the two major ways that we classify bacteria is called gram-positive or gram-negative by using a staining technique called gram-staining, okay? Excuse me, my voice gives out after talking so much, doing so many videos. But in gram staining, we use a, a, a series of stains that we add to the slide of bacteria. We wash one off after we fix it with a mordant. We add another one and gram positive bacteria will stain one color and gram negative bacteria stain a different color. Gram positive will retain a stuff called crystal violet. If you know what violet is, it's purple, so they are purple. Remember positive and purple. Gram negative bacteria, usually when we tell someone stop and we're being negative, it's red. And they, they pick up a reddish stain called saffronin. So what happens is, we talked about this in um, microscopy techniques, but you take a smear of bacteria, you add some crystal violet, and you'll heat it so that, um, well, no, you don't. You add some iodine as a mordant, and then you wash it away, and then you add some saffronin, and if it's gram positive, the crystal violet will stick. If it's gram negative, the crystal violet gets washed away, and the saffronin will, will enter the bacteria and stain them a reddish color. Well, it's not just whether they stain purple or red, violet or red, um, it's the why the stain sticks to the bacterium, and that why is dependent upon the composition of this outer covering of the cell, from the cell membrane, to the cell wall, to the glycocalyx. Now, um, when we look at gram-positive bacteria, I'm gonna draw two bacteria here next to each other. I'm gonna draw, um, let me erase this first. I'm gonna do gram-positive, and gram negative bacteria. And we're gonna go from outside, meaning out here, through the covering to the inside of the cell where the cytoplasm would be. Okay? Now, we've talked about this, the lipid bilayer, and essentially it's pretty similar between gram positive and gram negative. It's gonna be a whole bunch of these structures called lipids, phospholipids, and some, some of these phospholipids are gonna have some proteins associated with them on the inside called peripheral proteins, and some of these proteins will go through the middle called integral membrane proteins, and they will essentially look like this. Again, one of the major differences is that there's no sterols. And there's not a lot of difference between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria in this regard. And just bear with me while I draw this out, but I think when you see things unfold before your eyes, you remember it much better than if you're just um, seeing an image fixed. So that's why I like to draw everything out. So this we call the cell membrane or plasma membrane. Let me, let me erase a little bit of this so that I can write a little bit better. This is called the plasma membrane. And there's not much difference in the plasma membrane between gram positive and gram negative. There's really not, okay? There's proteins associated with them. They're very similar to eukaryotic cells, except for that they lack the sterols. Now the next layer is a layer that we're, that is a layer of, um, sugars that have some uh, amino acids attached to them called peptidoglycans. And one of the differences between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria is that gram-positive bacteria have very thick layers of these peptidoglycans. Okay, it makes a very thick peptidoglycan layer, where in gram-negative bacteria, the peptidoglycan is usually a single or maybe one or two layers of these peptidoglycans. And so, and I have to break the word apart to fit it in here, but the peptidoglycans in gram-negative and gram-positive 
are very different. Gram-positive bacteria have a very thick, multi-layered peptidoglycan layer, and gram-negative have a very thin peptidoglycan layer. And it turns out that in, in between the membrane and the peptidoglycan is a space called the periplasm. It used to be called the periplasmic space, but the periplasmic space is actually now known to be what we call periplasm. And the periplasm essentially has a lot of proteins and enzymes in it, and they play an important role in, um, in how these bacteria uh, can uh, perform a number of their functions. And we're going to get to some of these in just a minute, okay? Um, Now, essentially what we're talking about here is a layer that we're going to call the cell wall. And the cell wall of gram-positive have a very thick peptidoglycan, and this layer and the gram-negative have a very thin peptidoglycan layer. But what's also unique about gram-negative bacteria is that they have another lipid bilayer out here. And this is called the outer membrane. And this outer membrane is only found in gram-negative bacteria. It's not found in the gram-positive bacteria. And it's essentially another lipid bilayer. And it can have proteins embedded in it that actually have little holes in them that allow substances to move from the outside of the cell into the, um, through the cell wall into the peptidoglycan layer and the periplasm. So, these proteins happen to be called porins, like the pores in your skin, and they allow substances to be transported through here. Gram-positive bacteria lack the outer membrane. And so the cell wall of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria is extremely different. Gram-positive have a very thick peptidoglycan layer. Gram-negative have a thin peptidoglycan layer with an outer membrane. And again, that outer membrane has some porins in it. Now, as we start to look at this, one of the things that's really important is that there is a particular lipoprotein. A lipoprotein is a protein, or a lipid that has some proteins associated with it. And some of these lipoproteins, one of them that is... Um, passing through the peptidoglycan layer and attached to the space is called tychoic acid. Tychoic acid is an important compound and you should know what it is, okay? Um, and essentially what the tychoic acid does is um, is it allows for these bacteria to have some ability to attach to certain things. Now, when we look at the outer membrane of the gram-negative bacteria, they have another type of um, lipoprotein or a thing called a lipopolysaccharide that is attached to the outer membrane. And this is... We sometimes call it an LPS, which stands for lipo, meaning lipid, polysaccharide. It's a lipid with a lot of sugars attached to it. Polysaccharide meaning many sugars. Let me make sure what I'm writing is still visible on the edge of the screen. Yeah, it is. Okay. So these lipopolysaccharides, one of them is called lipid A. Lipid A is an important substance in a lot of gram-negative bacteria in that lipid A can, as they break down, can be released and becomes what we call an endotoxin. And so we can say that lipid A is toxic. It provides the toxicity of some of these bacteria, which can make you really, really sick. It can cause vasodilation. It can cause fever. It can cause... Um, basically what we call the inflammation reaction. And so this lipopolysaccharide, or some people say lipopolysaccharide, um, and there's two of them. There's uh, O-lipid or O-LPS, and there's uh, lipid A. We're gonna focus on lipid A for now, but lipid A 
is a lipopolysaccharide that's associated with the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria that can make them very toxic. These are the ones that really make you sick um, if we break down the bacterium and they release the lipid A. Now, um, this, is what, this is the layer that we would call the cell wall of our bacteria. So outside of the cell membrane, this tan layer that we call the cell wall would either be in gram-positive bacteria, a very thick peptidoglycan layer with tychoic acid, or it can be a thin peptidoglycan layer that is part of or associated with the periplasm where we have some enzymes that play a major role in bacteria. And then there's an outer membrane that has some lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides or lipopolysaccharides are only found in bacteria, not any other living organism cell walls. And that is what can make some of them extremely toxic. And one of the ones that we know is, uh, plays a role in this is stuff called lipid A. You should know those compounds. You should be familiar with them. Okay. So now, if you're in my class and you have printed my notes and you're following along in my notes, then you guys should know that we have this information for you. So we have the domain set up with the prokaryotes and all the eukaryotes. You should know what the difference between prokaryote or the term prokaryote, what it means before a nucleus, and eukaryote, meaning a true nucleus. You should know that all the different characteristics that we said about prokaryotes and eukaryotes, okay? So, excuse me a second. <clears throat> I'm going to be off screen, but you should know that prokaryotes um, include archaea and bacteria. They are unicellular. They have no membrane-bound organelles or no membrane-bound nucleus. Um, they have a single chromosome that is circular in nature. They can have some extra chromosomal DNA called a plasmid. They have a cell wall that is made up of proteoglycans or peptidoglycans, um, and it's extremely different than um, the cell wall of eukaryotes. They can divide by a process called binary fission. So essentially this guy could copy this chromosome and sometimes the plasmids and then split in two and each one grow into a fully grown bacterium. And you should know that they are rather small usually about one-tenth to about five microns in size. For eukaryotes, you should know that they include protista, fungi, plants, and animals. They can be single-celled, like in protista, or multicellular. They, can, they have membranous organelles and a membranous nucleus that contains the DNA, multiple chromosomes that are linear in shape. Um, only plants or fungi have cell walls. The cell wall in a plant is made out of cellulose. The cell wall in, in Fungi is made out of a stuff called chitin. They divide by mitosis, except for yeast, which is a type of fungus. Some yeast can divide by what we call budding. And that you should know that um, eukaryotes are rather large cells, between 10 and 100 microns on average. So, now if you're following along in my notes, if you look here, the next page will go over the nucleoid, the ribosomes, the cell wall, and the cell membrane. And that's about it. And then we talk a little bit about the capsule. Some bacteria have a capsule that surrounds the cell wall. So outside this cell wall, some bacteria also have a capsule, some do not. And that capsule, we said, can be called the glycocalyx. If it's a very thin layer, they call it the slime layer. Um, in addition to that, they can have some things sticking off of the surface of the cell. Um, fimbriae are these thin, -like, thin hair-like uh, structures that can provide attachment. Pili are somewhat of a shorter rod-shaped structure. We said usually that they can attach. They also play a role in attachment to plant or animal cells, which helps them cause an infection, or at least, um, um, well, it's their attachment that allows them to stick around. But there is a type of pilus called the sex pilus that allows some bacteria to undergo what we call conjugation, where they can transfer DNA from one cell to the other. We talked about flagella, which are very thin hair-like structures made out of protein that allow for motility. And we talked a little bit about axial filaments, okay? Um, if you have my notes, I have a simple drawing of a prokaryote and a simple drawing of a eukaryote. And I actually have another drawing of them sitting next to each other. And then as you go through the structures, 
we can talk about um, prokaryotes in great deal as far as the cell wall outside of their normal cell membrane. All of this information is extremely important. Now, um, and a lot of times this is called the cell envelope, which is the entire structure covering the cell. The cell envelope will usually consist of the cell membrane with the cell wall, and then if it has a glycocalyx um, or capsule, we can talk about that. And we will learn later on in the semester which types of bacteria are gram positive and which are gram negative and which ones have a glycocalyx or capsule or slime layer. Right now, I don't care that you memorize which one has which. I just want you to know these structures. Um, so within my notes, I hope you guys are following. If you follow along in my notes, we talked about the membrane lipids, okay? And we said that they lack sterols and bacteria. Um, one of the things I did not mention, but I want to make sure that I do, an archae bacteria, or an archae, not archae bacteria, that's how I first learned them, but it's changed throughout the years. In archae, the phospholipids are slightly different. Now, we're not going to get into the structure, but they are different phospholipids, even than bacteria, which is part of how we delineate them. Um, when we talk about the membrane proteins, some of these proteins are called peripheral proteins, loosely attached inside, and integral membrane proteins. Some of these proteins function in the transport of materials into and out of the cell in both eukaryotes and in prokaryotes. And there's different types of transports. There's um, um, proteins that are involved like pores or porins, channel proteins, and carrier proteins. We're not gonna get into that level of detail. You should know that from uh, your anatomy and physiology or your other biology classes. Now, the next layer would be the periplasm, which we usually find in gram-negative bacteria. Outside of that is the cell wall. Now, in gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, the peptidoglycan layer is extremely thick in many layers. In gram-negative bacteria, it is a very simple single layer or a, a maybe two layers that are meshed together, but it's not very thick, okay? Um, some, of the, some of the functions, by the way, that the cell wall can play is one, they help provide the shape of the bacterium, and we haven't talked about the shapes of bacteria, that'll be in another video. Another thing that allows bacteria to do is withstand what we call turgor pressure. To become turgid means to become stiff with fluid pressure. So if I took, a, a, I don't know, like a water balloon, but I had very little water in it, it wouldn't be very turgid, it would flop around. But if you fill it up to where it's very, very tight with water and it's hard to compress, then we would say that it is turgid, and it has turgor, T-U-R-G-O-R. The cell wall in bacteria plays a role in turgor pressure, which is why a lot of bacteria don't lice. The inside of bacteria is usually very hypotonic, and if you remember tonicity from your AMP and your biology and chemistry classes, if the outside is hypertonic and the inside is hypotonic, then we want, or sorry, we want, well, the fluid will move from an area of high water pressure or high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So, um, since the inside of the cell is very, um, well, bacteria take on a lot of water, and as they take in water, they could fill up and burst. What prevents them from lysing or rupturing a lot of times is this stiff cell wall that they have. It helps them withstand a, a turgor pressure. Um, let's see. Some antibiotics can affect the cell wall, and it plays a role in how the antibiotics can affect it, as well as lysozyme. Um, there's an enzyme in tears and in mucus, but mostly in the saliva, I should say, in tears and saliva, called lysozyme that can lyse the peptidoglycan layer and therefore damage the bacteria, okay? Um, now, there is a class of bacteria called mycoplasmas. Mycoplasmas actually lack the cell wall. They're a small group of bacteria that have no cell wall. So most bacteria have the cell wall, mycoplasmas do not. Um, 
Well, I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to go over in my notes. So, if you guys and gals have any questions, you can always look me up and email me. Um, so, I'm going to conclude this video here. I think that's all the detail that I wanted to show you. And this is a very simplified version of this. Um, so, it's it's more complex than this and we can talk about the types of sugars in here and we don't want to get into all of that at this point. Um, we will do that in due time when we, when we focus more on bacterial virulence and other things and how um, antibiotics and how um, antibodies and uh, leukocytes recognize bacteria and phagocytosin. So um, I hope that you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope this was informative. And if, again, if you like the videos, please hit like if you found it helpful. Let me know. Um, subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates when new videos are loaded. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.